Welcome to another episode of I Catch Killers. This week, we're doing something we haven't done before. We've gone down to Hobart in Tasmania, and we've been following a two-day inquest into the death of a young man called Jari Wise. Jari was just 26 years old when he was killed. He was a father. It was in February 2020. Jari was hit by a car, being driven by his girlfriend, Melissa Oates. Afterwards, police charged her with dangerous driving, driving a motor vehicle whilst exceeding the prescribed alcohol limit, and failing to stop and help after an accident. In court, Melissa pleaded guilty to all three charges. She was sentenced to 14 months jail with six months suspended. The judge found she was not responsible for Jari's death. I first heard about Jari's death when his mum, Faith Takalak, got in touch with me. After the criminal trial, she spent years campaigning for an inquest into how Jari died. Finally, the day arrived. Join me and producer Emily Pigeon as we go to Hobart this week to find out what happens next. The I Catch Killers podcast was a fresh start for me as I left policing behind and started a new life. Over the years, we've laughed together, cried and shared some powerful moments. Welcome to I Catch Killers. I'll just do a testing, testing. Okay, Gary. Okay. You ready? Yeah. Why are we here today? We're here today because it's uh, day one of an inquest into the death of Jari Wise. Uh, Jari uh, died uh, almost four years ago now, back in uh, February 2020, and uh, through a long and, I I would say, uh, torturous campaign in in part for the family, they've managed to finally get uh, uh, get the matter before the coroner. And who is Jari? Jari is an Indigenous man, a, a father of a, a young child, and uh, back in 29th of February 2020, he was struck by a car and killed uh, in a country town in uh, Tasmania. And that car was being driven by his girlfriend, Melissa Oates. So I've actually got a copy of the judge's sentencing remarks here with me. Melissa Oates pleaded guilty to dangerous driving and driving a motor vehicle while exceeding the alcohol limit and failing to stop and assist in case of an accident. Oates was found not to be responsible for Jari's death. Oates was sentenced to 14 months jail with six months suspended. So that was uh, the judge's findings there in April 2021. Now, people might be thinking, well, if this matter's already been before the criminal court, why is it before a coroner's court? Coroner's court is a completely different area than the criminal court. Criminal court's to uh, adjudicate on the charges that Melissa Oates was charged with, and she pleaded guilty. What the inquest is about, as distinct from the criminal trial, is to find out the cause and manner of death. So an inquest is a bit broader in the way that they look at Jari's death. I've seen a list of uh, the witnesses. They're calling uh, a, a, a lot of witnesses for the two-day hearing, but uh, the inquest will be focused on uh, the circumstances leading up to and the manner and cause of Jari's death. Mm. We're curious to know if there's any more to this story than we already knew, aren't we? Well, that's right. The focus on the criminal trial is kept very narrow. The focus is about the specific charges. An inquest, it's a lot broader. So we're here out the front of... Hobart Magistrates Court. It's the 6th of February. That's approximately four years after Jari's death. Just before uh, we started recording this, uh, I I met with uh, Faith, Jari's mother, and uh, you can see how tense and nervous she is and how traumatic it is. And what I know of Faith, having spoken to her on numerous occasions over the last couple of years, uh, she's a very emotional lady. She wears her emotions on the sleeve. She's passionate about finding out what happened to Jari. But what I'm seeing here is someone that's uh, feeling slightly uncomfortable. She's reliving her son's death. And uh, uh, there was a a motion to her too that she was putting on a brave front. But I know, or I can only imagine how stressful this whole thing would be for her. When did you first learn of the case? I became aware of the case. Faith was getting in contact with me when I started uh, the podcast and uh, different things I was doing. And Faith had been trying to get in contact with me and... uh, I got contacted by uh, 60 Minutes, uh, a producer, Laura Sparks, on 60 Minutes, who said that they're doing a story on Faith, and Faith has been trying to get in contact with you. And uh, so it's sort of a natural fit. Now, the reason why Faith wanted to get in contact with me, I think she had seen a a bit of the work I'd done when I was a a detective, a homicide detective, and uh, trying to find justice for for families. And uh, 
she made the comment to me that after she saw the brief of evidence and uh, I suppose confusion and frustration comes from a brief of evidence. They're confusing enough, but someone that's not involved in, uh, in the law, I could understand why it's so confusing and Faith reached out, uh, reached out to me to uh, see if I could uh, help her, I, I suppose, make sense of what had happened. Jari's mum, Faith, has spent years calling for an inquest into Jari's death. Today, that's going to happen. A few months ago, Faith joined me in the studio. I first spoke to you a couple of months ago. You, uh, you contacted me. At the time, you were sitting out on the uh, steps of the Attorney General's uh, building down in, uh, in Tasmania. I was, yep. Not so much on the steps this time, but rather in a warmer building. I had done the same thing a couple of years ago and was out in the freezing cold. I just have to get something out of the way. Um, generally, what's happening now doesn't usually happen. It's, um, it's only when we really get down to, I realise why I'm here speaking to you is because Jari's been killed. In a second, this will pass and I'll be fine. I just need you to know that. So. <laughs> Faith, you don't you don't have to apologise, and we can we can stop, and you can uh, ta no, take a breath. It'll go. Yeah. two seconds. I, and look, I apologise apologise to you to um, you know bring bring stuff up, but uh, no, it's not about it's not about that. I'm very well conditioned to stuff coming mm. up and hearing all the details. It's when I it's so hard to explain. I physically come back into myself and realise that I'm doing this because my son's been killed. Yeah just really hits home when I'm like I'm sitting where I am now or if I'm sitting in a courtroom, that's when it's, this is why I'm doing this. It was almost four years ago that Faith's life changed forever. She explains what her life was like in a world where Jari existed. So before I lost my son, I was disability support worker, loved my job, worked for seven years, aced it. My job. I was very good at that. I know I was. Big head. Um, yeah. <laughs> I, like, I like your confidence. <laughs> anyway, um, yeah, so mum of four basically just raised the kids until full-time school, not a big believer in childcare. Um, once the last one was gone and I was basically empty nested, I um, started working. Disability support. You must have a, have a lot of empathy uh, working in an area like that. It'd be challenging. Yeah, yes. And, yep. Yeah. Something that has happened to me though and it's something that I really struggled with for a long time was when I lost Jari, I lost my empathy for others, which makes me sound like a real hard ass. And at times I think to myself, wow, I'm, you know, I cannot go back to working disability because I cannot think of anything worse than cooking tea. The simple act of cooking tea for someone that can't cook tea for themselves where I used to take great pleasure in that and helping someone out, you know, giving them their best life, I couldn't be bothered with that. So it actually turned me into an arsehole, which I'm not, and this is because I've lost Jari in this way, and I, and I know that, and then I really did struggle with that. I actually spent some time in the mental health unit because I thought I was turning into an arsehole. I was acting in ways that I have never acted before, yeah, I was being, an, I was becoming really nasty, a really nasty person to be around, and that I really fucking struggled with that. Well, uh, emotional pain—it's how how it uh, can turn in, and it, it sounds like it, it's hardened you and uh, changed you from uh, what's happened to uh, to Jari and the person you, you're now. So there's some anger there. I, c I can see, I can see that, and there, but that anger's uh, coupled with pain as well. I learned a very, very valuable lesson my second time in the mental health unit and I've never shied away from being public about that. You know, you need to look after your mental health. It's just important as a freaking broken leg. Um, and it came from uh, another patient that was in there because I, I was just – I was my second stay was because I took myself to the hospital because I was going to go and kill someone. And I, I knew that I wouldn't because I've still got my beautiful three that are here being my children, yep. but but that urge to want to and to be thinking about it constantly was killing me, and it was making it was making it very hard to be mum, be wife, be friend when you've got that thought in your head. So I took myself off to hospital, medications coming out of my ass. That was all just friggin' awful. And this one patient came up to me and she said, "Sweetheart, don't let the hate be stronger than the love that you have for Jari." It was like click, pivotal moment. Changed, changed my whole outlook. 
that's uh, that's very good good advice to receive receive in a place like that. So, could you could you embrace that? Could you embrace that advice? Yes, and I've and I've used it. Generally, it used to end in a really awful way. Now I just hold my head up high and think of how much I love Jari, but it's so much better than unleashing the beast that used to be simmering away at me constantly. I, I, I've, I've spoken to lots of people in my policing career, but also on the podcast that lost lo- loved ones in, in different ways. And uh, what a lot of those people have said the same thing. They can't let that anger destroy them yep. because it, it's destroying all the memories and everything else. And I'm, I'm always amazed how people get, get through situations and the way that they, they turn it around and channel that anger into something positive rather than uh, destructive. So, yeah, well, it was the, it was the words of that woman. It really was. That yeah. actually changed everything for me. Yeah, because you, you've had uh, you've had a battle, and uh, you know I, I said half joking when you're at the attorney general's office, don't get it, get yourself arrested. But uh, you have managed to get yourself arrested in your uh, your efforts to find out what's happened to uh, Jari. Tell it. Tell us about those situations. Quite a few times, actually. <laughs> a few times in remand. I've got some beautiful stories of the remand centre. And once again, bear in mind, I. Prior to Jerry's death, I was just Susie Homemaker. Now I can tell you how to um, deal up a gram of speed and send it from one cell to the other cell in the romance center. <laughs> And that's not, yeah. That's... I, I, I'm, I'm laughing. I shouldn't be. I shouldn't be laughing. But anyway, yeah. You, it's amazing what you can pick up. Life skills in different. Yeah, uh, that's different right. Scenarios. Life skills yeah. maybe needed. Who knows? Yeah. Yeah. So you got yourself in the trouble. You got uh, locked up. One of the times was breaching an AVO. Yeah. First time, I think. And I'd been to the police myself several times. I'd actually called the police on myself and said, "Look, you know, I've just crossed the line. You know, I acted out. I've done the wrong thing." So. Not once did I ever say – the police were always right in coming to me and arresting me initially because I lost my shit. So you had had restraining orders out against you and you breached those? Is that – I did, yeah. I did, yep. So uh, because Honeyville or Honeyville. Hewenville. Hewenville. I laughed before because you called it Hooterville. (laughs) Hooterville. It used to be Hooterville. Not bad. Bring it back. So in – I would imagine a small country town. Yep. Everyone and, knows uh, everyone, mate. So everyone knows everyone's business, and you can bump Valley. into bump, <laughs> bump into people, and that's uh, yeah, not a good environment to be holding some real uh, anger towards uh, certain people in the community. Right. Oates actually calls me oh the redheaded investigator of the Hill and Valley. That's how that's how she refers to me. Yes, I went back to the scene and looked in the bushes and stuff. I did do my own investigation of my son's death. Um. And my husband would go to work, my kids would go to school. My coffee Mm. table would be cleared and that would be covered in papers, sticky notes, highlighters, full frigging investigator. Damn right I was investigating the Huon Valley. I think we've got to acknowledge, and it always surprises me with people, and again, I'm talking general sense, so let's not not, uh, panic we're attacking an individual, but it always surprises me where people think, how dare you investigate, like a a death of your son. What do they think happens when you lose a loved one? Mm. Like your whole world has been turned upside down. You want answers. And I pe- think people need to acknowledge that, whether it be the courts or, or people in positions of power. This is not something you just sit back and let pa- pass pass over and go, oh, thank you very much. You're not just going to, oh, okay, and leave that and hope that the police might catch it later because they won't. It's very easy to write someone off and go, oh, that lady, she's crazy. She just Mm. has never got over the death of her son. But the way you're coming across to me, I'm not seeing that. You seem quite, uh, you've acknowledged you had mental health issues, but the reason why you were there and how you turned that around, you seem quite, uh, you've got proper perspective on things. I think so. I think I do. Every now and then, um, no, I don't. Yeah, no, I actually am. I was unwell for quite some time, and but I, like I said to you before, I've addressed that. First was because I was so fucking sad and I couldn't deal with it. And the second time was anger. I was too angry, and I'm I'm one that everyone sort of says, "Oh, look, you know, your children need to see you grieve. You know, you can grieve." I'm not one of those parents that thinks that it's healthy for your child to see you buckled up on the floor. Yeah, that's not. And, and for me, because we're a very close family, there's not a great deal of time alone. So I had to be, you know, I'm the protector of these children. They, they don't want to see their protector 
in fetal position. So I, I had to take myself to hospital to give myself that time to come back and go, right, back, here I am again. Jari's uh, siblings, are they younger? What's younger, the, yeah. yeah. Two, two sisters and a little brother. Yeah, how, how, how much younger were they? Uh, There's four years between all of them. Okay, so they they would have been it would have been very raw for them. Well, the girls lost their best mate, their drinking buddy. Tobias is a bit younger and sort of, um, well, he he's uh, he's just seventeen now. So yeah, I sort of I've kept him. He's actually the golden child now, and we have a bit of a laugh about that because he is called the prince in the house because I do. <laughs> He's got so many similarities of Jari, the poor little bugger, the, the height and just this, his voice. Sometimes he'll speak and I'll, I'll have to message my daughter and say, oh, my fucking God, it's just, it's just like Jari. And when you hear recordings of him, he sounds like his brother. And I don't know. Yeah, it must I've be. Tr- I've tried to keep it so it's not unhealthy. I don't want him mm. to, you know, I'm not putting all this. To replace Jari. Yeah, 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 no, not at all. But, yeah, he was not allowed to have a sleepover until he was – yeah, seventeen, that sort of stuff, you know. I'm, I'm, yeah, he is precious. That sounds a bit nuts, but it's, no, I, I don't think. I think anyone listening wouldn't think that sounds nuts at all. Because that, I know that's the dangerous age too. You're seventeen, and your mates say, "Come on, jump in the car, let's go for a drink," or you know, I'm very lucky that I don't. I honestly don't know where that child came from because he's so intelligent, he's so level-headed. He makes me feel like a dickhead. He's, you know. <laughs> Yeah. I'm, l- I'm lucky to have that kid. Well, you, you must be doing a good job with him if he's cut, turning out that way. I don't way, know. So. I don't know how it's happened. <laughs> <laughs> so but yeah, my, but my girls, that, that it, it's um, impacted them immensely. I don't even know if there's a word for it, really, because they, yeah, they were drinking buddies. That's all. You know, there's there's brilliant clips of them all drinking together and dancing and singing and yeah. And that's yeah. You know, I, I I I want people and you're explaining it so well but the the impact that uh sudden death has on people it just your life you have before and then you have your life after and it just turn, turns your life upside down and uh your girls and your uh your son they, they all must uh still struggle with it in their own way yeah absolutely well my my eldest daughter i can't talk about her too much because it makes me cry because i'm just so proud of the person that she is she's she travels and she's she she's on, she's in Queensland, does her own thing. She's so staunch. She's just magnificent. And then my second daughter is pretty much a clone of myself. Um, I worry about them both terribly, but in particular the younger one, she's a um, single mum, brilliant mother to a pocket rocket of a child. I can't even babysit him for half an hour. He's just unbelievable. <laughs> yeah. um, she, Her brother was killed. She ended up in a women's shelter. Um, what else? The list goes on, and it's all a result of the fact that she was the trauma of losing her brother and how how it was dealt with. Yeah, yeah. Um, we'll probably talk about that in a minute. How yeah. I told my kids about what what had happened to their brother. Well, I, I, before we do, let, let's just find out a bit about Jari. So let's describe uh, describe Jari. Um, well, you couldn't get a shy a guy, so incredibly shy, until he had one or two stubbies and then he was everyone's mate. <laughs> and apparently when he had his funeral at Turnbull's funeral, they had ne- that was the largest one that had been in the state. And that's because no one met Jari. Everyone that Jari spoke to and spent some time with, even if it's just a couple of minutes, and I've heard this from his workmates at work, they loved him. And he he made everyone feel loved. He protected the underdog. He looked after people with disabilities. You know, if there's a kid that's in a group that's getting a bit picked on a bit, he's like, hey, you know, fucking back off, come over here, dude. You know, he was he was really supportive of people. Um, hilarious, really, really funny. Not many people can make me laugh out loud really quick, but that guy sure can. Um, great dad. Brilliant dad. So Melissa Oates, she and Jari were together for about uh, four years? Yeah, about four years. How did you feel the relationship when it first started? Never liked her. Never, ever liked her. Never took to her. And I I even tried and I was actually going through mine and Jari's messages just a couple of weeks ago where I, again, I was trying. So I'm like, his other girlfriends and his it's, 
the woman that he's got my grandson to, there's a love there that I have for her. That and I and I never not like anyone. I'm always, you know, I'm always I welcome anyone. But this, I just never. It was always well, funny story, right? He split up with his previous partner. I said, "Look, mate, stop going after all these hotties. Get yourself a chunky woman with a couple of kids. So when you come home from work, there's a meal on the table, and you know it's all hosed and hosed." Anyway, sitting at the Esplanade one day, and he pulls up in the car, and he's got two chunky girls in the car, and he goes, "What do you reckon, Mum? Which one you reckon?" And I'm thinking, "Oh God." Neither, please neither. <laughs> anyway, it ended up being out of the two, it was the wrong one. Had it been that other one, she I mean she's still a great chick. I still yeah. really like her. Yeah. So uh, just something that, uh, and yeah, you know, as a parent, you can't uh, can't choose your your children's partners. But no, uh, no, just... you can't. But it, but and you can't. No, but you can always act. Advice. A, and... Yeah, you can give them advice, and you can act accordingly to make that person, even though you don't like them feel welcome and comfortable in your home for your child's sake. Whereas Oats, I never had that. My gut right from the very beginning was correct. Did they uh, live together? They did, yep. Yep. And yep. That, oh, consistently or on again, off again? or On, on again, off again, yeah. yeah. It was um, – I'd say that it was a solid relationship for maybe two out of the four years, sort of, yeah, um, towards the end. He was spending more time at – Back at home with us or at a mate's place, yeah, it was yeah two years of good solid relationship, but the, the rest of the time was a bit, bit of- um, toxic. Okay. Yeah, and I and once again I want to say this: this is important. Yeah. I have never ever said that Jar is an angel. I've never said, "My precious child, look what you've done to my precious child. Look what's happened to him." Yes, he could yell. Yes, he could throw things around. Um, yeah, he might get into a bit of trouble at a party. It's not he wasn't a bloody saint, but he would never harm anyone. So there's I want I, I, That's... I, I just people are always like, oh look, you know, doesn't she realise what Jari did this night? And I'll hear about that he might have, and, and he did when he was young. When he was when he was fourteen, he broke all the bloody trees that they put down the main street in Huonville, and that was really embarrassing because that's you know, dude, you don't do this. So, but I, I never shy away from that. He was he wasn't a saint. Can I now take you to uh, the time when you uh, you found out that uh, something could happen to uh, Jari? How, mm. how, how were you informed? Where were you? And, and talk us through it. Well, it's classic movie stuff. It was in about 2 o'clock in the morning. There was a knock on the door and the light shining through, the police light. And so for about 12 months after that, I had to have the front door covered because I, did, I don't know, just any lights out, that's – a weird thing of mine, but yeah, the door had to be covered. I opened up the door and this young officer, and I still feel like they sent this boy that probably was the same age as Jari to tell a woman, a mother, that her child had been killed. Mm. Anyway, he, I opened the door and he had his hat on his chest. He didn't say a friggin' word. I screamed to my husband to bedrooms just sort of to the right of the front door, get up, I already knew. And so... I can't really remember his words then. Then I remember being on the floor um, in the bedroom and the noises. I know other mums have said this as well. And I don't want to take away from dads. Obviously, it's terrible for a father to lose their child. And I don't know, I feel uncomfortable saying this, but I think for a mother it's more a physical pain. So something really happens inside your body when you hear that your child – is no longer here. And so, and the sounds are very similar to giving birth. Sort of, I don't know, it's a very, I can remember the primal sounds. And I also remember being very mindful of this young boy who's standing there that's just given me this news. So I stood up a couple of times and gave him a hug. I was saying, I'm so sorry, darling, they've sent you to do this. Because there's more experienced coppers in the town that could have dealt with this sort of stuff. I felt like that was a bit of trauma. I mean, I don't know if it's an initiation thing, but I really felt for him to have to witness that. So there's there's me, a mess on the floor, my husband dry reaching, and um, yeah, this poor young copper having to deal with all that. And I never actually got to go and see. I was always thinking in the back of my mind, I've got to go and find him and, you know, I don't know, give him a bloody flowers or a hug or something because it was that was I think that was a really massive moment. In, I know. Obviously, it wasn't in my life. I don't, I don't know how someone can do that, and especially a young guy. 
I, I can say, and I've, I've delivered those messages too often, and it, yeah. it stays, uh, stays, stays with you. From the time that he knocked on the door and opened the door, and you knew instinctively it was Jari, and you I knew it immediately. And then I was on the floor. Can I can can I ask why that was uh, the thought process that you had? I just knew it. I don't I don't know, Gary. I can't. I don't know. I, I just I, because I'd known because I don't know. Generally, when there's a knock at the door and there's a court torch right there, they have Jari with them. There's no other reason for the police to ever come to my home other than to bring Jari to me because she needed to quote unquote cool down. I opened the door and he's standing there with his hat on his chest without my son. It became obvious immediately. Yeah. So the the process after that, did you uh, go to the scene? Did you go to the yeah, hospital? Yeah, yeah. Well, I spent well, quite a bit of time on the floor. My husband was vomiting. I had to um, go into my youngest son who was in bed and oh, I just laid on his bed and held him for a second. I said, oh, mate, your brother's been killed. And and that was all. And then I came out. So I, I'm, I don't think I dealt with that well. I didn't know what else to do. At the same time, while the policeman's there and I'm on the ground, my phone's ringing. My daughter, who was in Darwin at the time, someone had heard over a scanner that um, someone had been hit and killed and that it was Jari Wise. So, and she was in a nightclub. So her boyfriend had to take her out of the nightclub, take her back to the house. She was 10 parts pissed with this information. So she's ringing me. So I'm up off, oh, I'm on the ground then up off the ground, hugging this copper, then talking to my daughter, back on the ground. For some reason, you just there's, there's no – you can't stand up. I don't know why I had no energy to stand up. I was just to the ground. So I've got my distraught child on the other end of the phone. Uh, thank God she was with her partner at the time, so I was able to speak to him and make sure that he was going to, if he can, look, take care of her through that bit of time. Um, policeman left. Then um yep straight to Jari, I went we went straight to the scene, just chucked on my dressing gown and we went there. My oh, and was Jari's uh, body still there? It was yep. I didn't see him for a long time, so we came around around the corner, and you could see that the road was blocked off. It was still dark, obviously at this time. Um, I parked as close as I could to the scene, got out of the car, and they weren't going to let me. Because it was a crime scene, they weren't going to let me anywhere near Jari, which I understood. Um, they let me a little bit closer than what they did said initially, and so I sort of sat there in the gutter for a little while, and then I was like, oh, my God, how the hell am I going to tell my other daughter? Because so, uh, oh, I don't know. Anyway, left Jari's sight, went back and had to wake my other child up, who was like seven Ks away, to let her know that Jari had been killed. Um, left. She also had a partner there at the time, so I felt like, the, you know, I just had to get back to Jari. Went back to the scene and I was sitting in the gutter and cars kept pulling up with their phones. The police weren't able to control the traffic that was coming. So I had to get out. I had to get up off the, out of the gutter and direct. Three or four cars came and I reached in through the window and said, give me your phone and deleted what they'd recorded. So they were recording the scene and I had to say to the copper, look, I can't, you need to come over here and stop these fucking cars from coming up and taking photos of this site. Um, I'm still really pissed off about that. That shouldn't have been my job. I shouldn't have had to direct traffic away from, Jari should have had that dignity it, and that was taken away because they, you know, and that's a tricky one because the, the officer that was in charge of that at the time, I did develop a bond with and I did think that, you know, I feel bad because he was doing the best he could, but it, it wasn't good enough. Uh, look, it, it's it's always hard. I, I'm not uh, defending police. I, I'm just saying how it is when situations like that, that's chaotic and uh, there's so many things that you're trying to attend to and, and do. So it's not, uh, not an ideal situation and it can never be done perfectly from mm. uh, the loved ones that, that turn up at the scene. It seems so clinical. There's processes in place. So I can understand the uh, understand the uh, frustration. When did you find out that it was he died as a result of uh, being hit by a car, being driven by Melissa? When when the policeman, when they knocked on the door, that was at the house. There'd been a motor vehicle accident 
and unfortunately Jari is deceased. And so well, I actually didn't even see Jari's body for a, a good couple of hours. So it's all it's all um it's all blocked off. I'd finally got the um, public under control with, with the help of another copper eventually, and then my husband said, "Oh, is that Jari over there?" And I was like, "No, he'd be up pointing like pointing up to where all the um, police were." In my mind, there was fire engines and ambulances and everything, but there wasn't. It was just police cars there. And I thought, oh, well, Jari would be up there. And I just assumed he'd have a tent over his body and all that sort of stuff like you see in the movies. Mm. Anyway, um, the sun started coming up and my husband said, is that Jari over there? I sort of argued with him, no, don't be so stupid. He's up there further. Anyway, a bit of wind came and lifted up this white sheet and there was my child's hand. So this whole time that I'd been sitting I thought Jari was about, I want to say, a kilometre away from me, but he was actually about 10 metres. So that, and, and we were sitting there, you know, from two in the morning. I think I discovered that that was Jari's body. Obviously, I probably got my times wrong. It feels like six, seven o'clock in the morning. Anyway, I realised that was Jari. I started screaming at the cop. Look, what? No one is with him. No one's with him. No one, there's nothing around him. He's by himself over there. Let me go over. Um, knowing that I couldn't, um, said to my husband, oh, I need to, can you get me a drink out of the car? I think I'm going to be sick. So he went to get me a bottle of water. I watched the other officer talking to some a car that had pulled up. He was talking to them and another copper that was sitting in his car, I watched him, saw him put his head down and he was riding. I thought, fuck you all, I'm going to my baby. And ran to Jari and it was like the running, when you're running in a movie, when you're you're running, but you can't. You're not moving. Anyway, ran to Jari, and then bang! I was. It's like I was hit by a brick wall. It was two coppers that, and I thank them now. Bang! I ran into their bodies and their 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 suits, and just dropped to my knees. But it was I was in like about within a meter and a half. So I saw Jari, and I wish, fucking wish I didn't. I wish that I didn't. You th- and um. I needed to be with him and I needed to hold his hand because he was on the ground alone. But how I wish, I shouldn't have done that. I should not have done that. So we've just left the court after day one of the inquest and we're here in the hotel lobby. So today was a pretty dramatic day in court. To me, it kind of felt like a scene from Judge Judy or something like that, everything that was kind of happening. (laughs) Yeah, well, that's an interesting way of describing it. Um, It certainly took uh, twists and turns. You you had uh, a witness that uh, didn't appear and got arrested, a warrant issued. Mm -hmm. You had another witness that was uncooperative to the point where she was taken off the video link and brought Mm -hmm. into the court and warned by the coroner the importance of uh, just answering the questions. I find that highly unusual and then again unusual for a court matter you've got a witness coming into the witness box and providing evidence that's contrary to what the witness has provided in the stat deck you've been to a lot of court cases and a lot of inquests throughout your career have you ever seen anything like what happened today i've I've seen a lot of things in court but today i've got to say this was unusual um and I, i look back over 30 years sitting in courts giving evidence in court yeah to have a witness arrested, I've seen that before. I've, I've seen uncooperative witnesses. I've seen witnesses um, change their statement, uh, uh, change their version from a written statement to when they give evidence. But a combination all in one short day at court, uh, yeah, it's been uh, quite fascinating. Whether it uh, warrants uh, a Judge Judy comment, I'm not sure. But it was a, uh, was a heavy day. And I think also the other thing that jumped out to me about today's inquest was the amount of uh, people there Um, and obviously um, with people out the front of court you don't see that quite often and there was a lot of signs I don't know there might have been a dozen or so signs lots and lots of people out there uh, justice for Jari so something's going on here for sure Mm, there was even a wreath of flowers hanging on the stairwell yeah, yeah, I noticed that. There was a lot of, uh, and it's not unusual for an inquest, but uh, there was a lot of feeling and emotion attached to this inquest and it was cleared by the public uh, public display. Who was in the courtroom to start with? You had um, the uh, counsel assisting the coroner, the, the coroner obviously, and um, then a legal representative representing uh, Jari Wise's family and also a legal representative uh, representing uh, Melissa Goats. 
also see that in the um, court was Jari's family, uh, Faith, his mother, and I don't know, there would have been about uh, 20 or 30 people that was uh, got to standing room only. There was a lot of members of the press in there as well. The read I got from the people in the court was that they were there to support uh, Jari. I, I was trying to work out the dynamics of the group of people there. They all seemed to know each other or have a loose association, and I got this... Yeah distinct impression they were people there in support of uh, Jari. On the night of the collision, Melissa and Jari had been drinking at Jessica Hoskins place. After the collision, Melissa went back to Jessica's house. Melissa and Jessica then went to the site of the collision together to see what had happened. Now, first we heard from Jessica Hoskins. Well, we didn't really hear from Jessica Hoskins. That was the interesting part. Uh, she didn't uh, turn up. She didn't make herself uh, available. And uh, the communications that were heard in the court was that uh, she was not fit to give evidence. I My take on it was the magistrate wasn't happy with that and uh, pushed, pushed the issue. Uh, there was a medical certificate that was produced. Mm, Five-month-old medical five, certificate. Five, five months old. And I think the issue was raised, is that really relevant? Um, the inquest was suspended for a short period of time. Inquiries were made and then it was reported back to the court that um, she wasn't prepared to give evidence. Mm. And the coroner issued a warrant for her arrest, didn't he? Yeah, the coroner, my take on it, that uh, the coroner was displeased with that and uh, a warrant was in fact issued uh, for her arrest, which is a rather, I won't say un unusual, but an, it's an extreme move, a warrant uh, for her arrest and uh, that she was had to abide by the uh, summons to appear at court. But then later in the day we heard that Jessica Hoskins was taken into custody by police. In yeah, the local so town. the uh, I believe it was a police officer was sent out to uh, apply for the uh, warrant. Uh, came The police officer came back a short time later and indicated that the warrant had been issued. Uh, Jessica was uh, arrested by virtue of the warrant. Then uh, the court was informed, and this was later on during the day, that police reported back to the court that they don't think that she was fit to give evidence. And uh, the coroner then made a uh, decision not to compel her to give evidence in the, in the circumstances. We then heard from Amber Lovell, who was Melissa's cousin. Yeah. She was one of the witnesses who testified in court. She told the court during the criminal trial that she had seen Jari jump out in front of the car previously. Amber Lovell was um, due to give evidence by video link and uh, when she appeared there was the usual delays getting the uh, the link up and running. So I think every... it took about 30 minutes to get her on the screen. Yeah, which is, yeah, it is, tech, you bring technology in the court and this ten, tends to happen. But uh, there was a delay and eventually they, the system was up and working and uh, she uh, appeared, Amber appeared uh, via video link it was apparent that uh, she was reluctant. Um, her answers to uh, initial questions were, um, I don't know, the kindest way to describe this was it was a person that clearly didn't want to be there. Now, there were some very strong comments made by uh, Amber to that effect. Mm. Only a few minutes into being questioned by the counsel assisting, the court heard Amber say things along the lines of, I'm scared. I feel sick, I can't do this, I said no, I don't remember, she was sniffling, she was wiping tears away from her eyes, she was resting her hands in her head. Well, and she said it in very uh, colourful language too, there was a lot of uh, F this and F, F that. Um, I was very curious to how it was going to be handled. I hadn't seen someone, and I've spent a lot of time in courts, so I hadn't seen someone uh, give out such an impression that they're not prepared to uh, cooperate in the circumstances. The court heard Your Honour say, I'm directing you to answer these questions. They're simple. The quicker you do this, the quicker you're out of here. When she was questioned further, the court heard Amber say that this is too long ago to remember anything. The coroner gave her her last warning, to which the court heard her say, I would rather be locked up than deal with this shit. After that comment, the coroner ordered her to be brought to court in custody. The magistrate, uh, he then left left the court and Amber was brought into court by police. So the video link was uh, taken away and she was uh, placed in the witness mm -hmm. box. The court also saw before she entered the main courtroom with everyone, on the video link she slammed the door, she just walked out, she was quiet. 
emotional, wasn't she? She got up and uh, and walked out, and uh, very. Uh, it was disrespectful to the court in the way that she carried on. She was obviously a very reluctant witness. So when she finally did arrive in the main courtroom in the witness box, there was a bit of kind of kerfuffle over the statutory Her- declaration. The court heard that uh, she was confused by the statement that was presented to her in the witness box whilst in court was different to the statement or the stat deck that she was referring to when uh, she was giving evidence on the video link. That was clarified later in court and it was declared to the court through all the parties, when I say the parties, all the legal representatives and the coroner, that in fact the document that she had in the witness box giving evidence in person was the same as the document that she had when she was giving evidence via the video link. So what she was complaining about was shown not to uh, be correct. The only difference was the annotations on on the paper. Yeah. So then the next witness that we heard from in the witness box was Katie Sheed. Now, she was living with Melissa and Jari and the kids at the time of the accident. She was one of the witnesses who testified in court. What did we hear from her? Yeah, well, that was an interesting uh, interesting twist to the uh, inquest. Katie was sworn into the witness box and, uh, as is the norm, she was provided a copy of her stat deck and uh, she was asked, is it true and correct? She said, indicated that she believed it was, but she clarified a particular paragraph where there was reference to Jari jumping out in front of the car and she, in fact, said it was a situation he didn't jump in front of the car. This was four years before the incident in which uh, Jari died. He, in fact, jumped away from the car and the car hit him, hit his knee. Mm. Her exact words were that they were driving along Glenwood Road in Tasmania and he was standing on the side of the road. She said it was obviously dark and that Melissa didn't see him. So Katie yelled at her and she swerved. He jumped back and had a bruise where he clipped the mirror. Then Katie told the court that Jari was standing on the edge of the road on the bitumen. He was facing towards the car and he was standing out to try and get Melissa to see him, but she didn't and he realised that, so jumped away as she clipped his knee. Yeah, and that uh, goes to a very uh, key part part of the inquest because there was a lot of information about Jari had this predisposition predisposition jumping out in front of Melissa's car when she's she's driving it what in fact the evidence that uh, Katie she provided was well completely the opposite he jumped away from the car not towards the car yeah and so then later on we heard from Dr Don Ritchie who was a forensic pathologist and he performed the autopsy on Jari in March 2020 he said that Jari suffered severe trauma to his entire body resulting in an instantaneous death or near instantaneous death. Was there anything interesting that you made from his comments? Look, it's a, a forensic pathologist giving evidence in an inquest of this nature. It's When I say it's not interesting, it, it's gruesome in the details that they provide. That this is you know, the injuries that uh, a person sustained during, uh, during this uh, incident. I, I've done this type of work enough times to realise that uh, someone that comes into collision with a car at 110 kilometres an hour, that's, the injuries are going to be significant. From an emotional point of view, I, I was looking around the court and uh, saw that it brought faith to tears where he was talking about the Jari's a part of what appeared to be Jari's mm. moustache on the windscreen of the car. It was fairly gruesome. Mm, yeah, Dr. Richley told the court that a small but central portion of moustache was missing from his face and it was present in the windscreen of the vehicle, but the general impact injuries were at the front of his body. Yeah. It's pretty pretty um, grim to hear when your family's sitting there. It, it was, and uh, I also noticed during that time that uh, Faith asked, and I, I'm... I've, I've now realised that one of them was her daughter and uh, some other younger members of the family or, or supporters to leave the court at that time because of the gruesome nature of the evidence that the uh, forensic pathologist provided. Mm. Day one of the inquest ended with Senior Constable Kelly Cordwell. She's worked for crash investigations for 16 years. She's attended over 300 fatal and non-fatal crash investigations, one including Jari's. What did you find interesting from, from her? I think she gave um, very succinct evidence. Obviously, this is an area of expertise that she's in, involved in. 
What I took away from, from that, uh, from her evidence, and it was fairly lengthy uh, evidence that uh, she spent informing the courts of her examination of the crime scene, that there were no um, skid marks, there was no tyre marks in the gravel, no skid marks before the accident, no skid marks after the accident, and no marks in, in the gravel. So the court heard from Senior Constable Caldwell that... The scene, she examined the scene where the incident occurred, where Jari was struck by the vehicle being driven by Melissa Oates. A couple of significant things that she mentioned was that there were no what appeared, no obvious skid marks um, before or after the crash. There were no tyre marks in the gravel on the gravel verge of the road, um, which indicated the car just continued straight along the roadway. The court also heard that there was blood splatter on a no standing sign in the gravel, which suggests that the deceased was potentially airborne for a significant distance. Yeah, in my understanding and, and what the courts uh, heard today was that uh, Jari was airborne after the collision with, with the car because uh, she also gave, an in, uh, during this evidence, the senior constable's evidence, she also indicated that tests were done to um, determine the speed at which the car was travelling at the time of impact and uh, the conclusion she came to was that it was around 110 kilometres and from that impact Jari was um, propelled into the air and I think travelled for approximately 30 metres. In the next episode of I Catch Killers, we'll hear from Amber Wilson, who will talk about how this case could change the law, and from Jari's mum, Faith. And we're going to see where this inquest takes us.